We are going to be doing uh, Unit 5, Topic 3. The notes here start on page 14. Uh, some overall thoughts about this topic. We're going to be doing Mendelian genetics. We're going to try to explain how shared, conserved, fundamental processes and features support the concept of common ancestry and the inheritance of genes and traits. Uh, we're going to talk about Mendel. Uh, in Mendel's Laws of Inheritance. So here we go. So let's talk common ancestry to start. DNA and RNA carry genetic information. Genetic information is how these traits are conserved in us and are passed down. Um, funny enough, genetic code shared by everything that's alive, plants, animals, bacteria, it's all the nucleotides that we have available, the adenine, uh, and the thymine and cytosine and uracil and guanine, that is shared from you and your cats and bacteria and dogs and everything. This is what Gregor Mendel studied. He studied this idea of inheritance and uh, created two laws that can be applied to the study of all genetics and all genetic traits. So to understand um, why you know, your pet is a pet and you are a human, we have to study what Gregor Mendel did, which was peas. Here he is, in all of his monk glory. He was an Austrian monk. <clears throat> he experimented on pea plants, discovered the basic principles of heredity, how things are passed down, how traits are passed down from one generation to the next. Um, but why did he use pea plants? Um, other than the fact that he was in the past and very old, it has many varieties, right? Um, you can control mating, so there's not that uh, random mating portion to genetic diversity. You can really kind of control the variables uh, in a relatively short generation time. I mean, we're going to grow them in like two, three days. So uh, this is why he used pea plants. They were a good model. There are some traits of pea plants that also made them ideal. They, he only tracked characteristics in two distinct forms, right? Color. It's an independent variable. Purple, white. Seed shape, round or wrinkled. Uh, to help control his experiments, he used true breeding plants. So true breeding plants are actually very interesting. They, um, if you've ever heard of like heirloom tomatoes, right? That's a true breeding organism. A true breeding organism, it produces offspring of the same variety over and over and over and over again. So heirloom tomatoes came to be because we found the most perfect tomato and then we planted that seed and then we hybridized it and then planted it again and it made those tomatoes over and over and over again. So the, and a great example of this is a true breeding purple pea plant, purple pea plant, it's only going to produce purple offspring. When we pollinate it with itself, because plants can do that, um, we only get purple purple pea plants, right? So that is what we call a true breeding. I could breed that plant over and over and over again, and it's still gonna be purple until the end of time. Um, let's talk about generations, because if we're gonna talk about how traits get passed down, we have to talk about how the language around these generations. So the P generation is a true breeding parental generation, right? So you can see over here, we have the violet flowers. If I self hybridize this and planted it for forever, it's gonna make violet flowers. White flowers, same thing, true breeding plant, always gonna be white. You have the F1 generation. This is first filial generation. It's a hybrid offspring of these two. So if you wanna think of it as like, one's the mom, one's the dad, whatever. Now we have a hybrid progeny uh, called the F1 generation. <clears throat> um, if we take uh, this F1 generation and again, breed it, uh, hybridize it, we get the F2 generation, the second filial offspring of the F1 generation. So there you go, you do that, then we get boom, and we get boom. Boom, boom, boom. The P the F and the F2. That's what we'll be talking about. The P, think of it as like the parental generation, true breeding. F1 is the first one after the after the parents. F2, it's like the, the parents, and then the first kid and the second kid. Actually, not quite, no. Cross that out. All right, so I'm sure you're familiar with Punnett squares, 
this is how these are diagrams. Uh, they're used to predict allele combinations of offspring from a cross with known genetic components. So we know that, uh, you know, this is always going to be a true breeding medicine, a true breeding event. We assign letters to that. Capital letters denote dominant traits and lowercase letters denote recessive traits. So uh, if we know something is a dominant or a recessive, these are known genetic components. We use Punnett squares to figure out um, and make predictions about next generations. Some vocabulary that we're going to be talking about and using a lot of uh, homozygous. This is an organism that has a pair of identical alleles for a character. So for example, this is homozygous dominant. So let's say that this uh, allele here is a trait for whatever's dominant, right? Like um, brown hair, right? And we have another one here, we call this homozygote dominant. <clears throat> homozygote recessive, same thing, but with the lowercase letters. That's like, you know, blue eyes or whatever. Heterozygote organism has two different alleles for the same gene. So here we go. We represent it by a capital and a lowercase. Right, so that is uh, heterozygote. A genotype is what we use to talk about the entirety of the genetic makeup of an organism. Your genotype, this is all of the things. It's not your DNA. It's your genotype. A lot of your DNA is a little, is like junk DNA. Some of them are telomeres, repeating sections. We'll get into that into the next unit. Uh, your genotype is the thing that makes all the proteins and codes for everything. Finally, your phenotype is an organism's appearance, right? So um, determined by the genotype. So for example, if um, you're a heterozygote for a, a, you know, a gene as opposed to being homozygote recessive or homozygote dominant, those may present themselves differently. Um, I forget the example that we use in class. We'll, we'll get to it. I believe it's a, a cancer suppressor gene, the P53 gene, right? You have to be uh, uh, homozygote dominant or heterozygote to be able to express that. That is the phenotype, the expression, but the genotype um, is the genetic makeup of it. Okay, so just remember genotype, genetic makeup, phenotype is the appearance. Great. So we do test crosses, right? A test cross, it helps us determine if a trait is heterozygote dominant or, homo, or homozygote dominant or heterozygote. Um, you can see up here we have gametes from an unknown phenotype or an unknown genotype. We know the phenotype, it's an unknown genotype. We have gametes from a recessive parent over here. So uh, to do a test cross in practice, you would get a uh, like a true breeding plant over here and then you would get like an unknown over here. Uh, and then you would do the test cross and determine in this example here, all of the P's are yellow. Yellow appears to be dominant. Same over here. You would uh, made it with a known genotype. And from an unknown parent over here, you can determine by its children which one it is. This will make a lot more sense in practice. Okay. Let's get back to Mendel. Principles. So these are the things that he came up with. Mendel, in his experiments of these pea plants, of hybridizing plants and taking the pea generation and mating them together and then noticing that the F1 generation is one color or another color and then mating that in a different color, he developed these two fundamental principles. And this is true for all of genetics. One is the law of segregation. The second is the law of independent assortment. So law of segregation, law of independent assortment. These are going to be discussed in so much more depth as we go, because these two things um, really apply to all of genetics. So this is what he discovered. He noticed that when the cross between a purple and a white plant, so this is in the P generation, uh, of true breeding for each, so true breeding, I can breed this forever. It's going to be purple for the rest of its life. Same thing with the white. Uh, he noticed that it produced only purple. And he said, that's weird. Where did the white go? 
Did it disappear? No, because the white pea flower characteristic came back in the next generation. Like how mind blowing is that? Imagine knowing nothing about genetics, nothing about anything, no sign, you're a monk, right? And you're saying, oh, what lovely purple flowers. Oh, what lovely white flowers. Oh, why are they all purple? Where did the white go? Oh, let's try it again. And all of a sudden the white comes back. That's wild. How is this possible? I'm sure are words that came out of Gregor Mendel's mouth, but it was in Austrian. And I don't know how to speak that. There you go. F2. Oh, white flowers. Where'd they go? This is where he developed this concept of dominant and recessive. He hypothesized that the purple flower has to be dominant in some way to the white flower, which is a recessive trait. Okay, so that's where we came up with this idea of dominant and recessive, is the dominant allele is going to show up in the F1 generation if the P generation is true breeding. It takes dominance over the other. It almost masks it. Um, he did this for the same thing for so many different things in pea plants. This is why pea plants worked out so much. And he got the same results every time. And that's so wild. He found out that the F2 generation was always, look at that bold, always a 3 to 1 ratio. Always. To explain this, and, and when we say three to one ratio, let's just let's just let's talk about what we're doing here. Three to one ratio here is that seventy five percent of the offspring were one thing, and twenty five percent of them were another thing. It didn't matter if he had five hundred plants, five thousand plants, five million plants. It always hit this ratio of seventy five being one color, or one you know wrinkled or full or constricted or round or tall or short 75 percent and 25 percent always that's wild so to explain this he observed the f2 generation uh and he created a model with four concepts the first is that alternate versions of genes or alleles account for variations in inherited characteristics. So there's something in there, these alleles, this dominant or this recessive allele account for these variations. For each character, an organism inherits two alleles of a gene, one from each parent. If two alleles at a locus differ, then the dominant allele determines the appearance, that's your phenotype, and the recessive allele has no noticeable effect. This is how he developed this idea of the law of segregation, is that two alleles for the same trait separate during meiosis, during gamete formation, and they end up in different gametes. Same trait, purple flower, white flower, separate and end up in different gametes. Whew, it's a lot to take in, it's pretty crazy. So let's take a closer look at alleles. So we got these two chromosomes here, one from parent one, one from parent two. Here is the height gene locus. So on this portion of the chromosome, this band right here determines how tall the plant is going to be. And here we have P gene locus. So this is either smooth or wrinkled peas, like the actual peas. And they're on, you know, they're at the same point, but here's a chromosome from one and here's a chromosome from the other. Remember, somatic cells are diploid. We contain two copies of each chromosome. Um, alleles alternate ver uh, alternative versions of genes, right? So tall is an allele. Wrinkled or smooth, right? These are versions of the same gene. Boom, right there. Okay, somatic cells are diploid. They contain two copies of each chromosome, one from mom, one from dad, one from parent one, one from parent two, or if you're a pea plant, hybridized. Um, there you go. So the law of segregation here, 
says that each one of these chromosomes, one from parent one and one from parent two, are going to separate during meiosis. So you have the appearance up here. Let's just take a look at this as your P generation. So this is purple flowers, true breeding. So we do capital P, capital P. I don't know why they ever use P. It's the dumbest letter or one of the dumbest letters to use as a capital or a lowercase. But this is, what, this is where we're at. So capital P, capital P, that's your true breeding purple. Lowercase P, lowercase P is your white. Anyway, in your F1 generation here, you're going to get one from your mom or one from your purple mom and one from the white flower, right? So when they go together, this is the genotype of your F1 generation. And it's always going to look like this because purple is dominant. So everyone here is going to be a heterozygote purple flower. When this hybridizes, now we have half and half. So when we're looking, sperm and eggs, right? So one from one parent, one from the other, we get dominant, dominant, so heterozygote dominant, I'm sorry, homozygote dominant, heterozygote over here, heterozygote over here, and heterozygote or homozygote recessive. But what Mendel's seeing, right, because remember, Mendel didn't know anything about genes. What he saw is three of them are purple and one of them is white. But this is the law of segregation, is that each one of these alleles, and we have two of them, to determine our phenotype or our appearance. The appearance here is purple or white, right? The genetic makeup, we have two of these, and they separate independently of each other. Great. True breeding plants will have two identical alleles, right? This is what we're talking about here. Homozygote recessive, homozygote dominant. Boom. For each gamete, for uh, each gamete for the P generation will contain one allele for flower color. In this case, they're true breeding. So every gamete has the same allele, right? So they'll, this is what we were just talking about. Here's the allele for flower color. And this one, it's purple and it's dominant. This one is recessive. Boom, right there. F1 generation are all hybrids. These are your heterozygotes with one dominant and one recessive. F2 generation is going to be a cross of these heterozygotes. And it produces always a three to one ratio. Always, always. Anytime you see a question on the exam, that says the cross of a heterozygote produces what ratio? I'm gonna say three to one, always, always. So that's what we call monohybrid crosses. The law of segregation was determined by doing crosses between true breeding plants, which produce F1 hybrids, known as monohybrids, so for example, if you take dominant true breeding, recessive true breeding, all the F1 are going to be heterozygote. Monohybrid cross is a cross between those F1 generations. Boom, right there. Boom, right there. So pollen, pistol, come together. It's going to look three to one phenotype three to one, always. All right, law of independent assortment. So a uh, second principle that Mendel figured out is uh, what we call the law of independent assortment. This means that the genes for one trait are not inherited with the genes of another trait. Instead of following one trait in his crosses, this time Mendel followed <gasps> two traits. P color and shape. 
And what did he figure out? Oh, wait, this law only applies to genes that are located on different chromosomes, not homologous, or genes that are very far apart on the same chromosome. That's kind of important. This law only applies to genes that are located on different chromosomes. There, the reason for that is because uh, genes that are really close together or are located really close on the same chromosome um, tend to not cross over with each other simply because of the distance. It's too close for that crossing over to happen. So only applies to different chromosomes or genes that are very far apart on the same chromosome. Okay. We all know Punnett squares. We all know monohybrid crosses. Let's do some dihybrids. So a dihybrid determined this law of independent assortment. Um, so we had two plants true breeding for two different traits, which produced F1 hybrids. We call those dihybrids. So a dihybrid requires a dihybrid cross. So for example, we are true breeding for our yellow, yellow peas, and round, right? Those appear to be dominant traits, and they're true breeding for each. Down over here, that's green and wrinkled. All F1 hybrids at this point would be a heterozygote. Dihybrid cross is a cross between the F1 generation. So the concept behind it is the same, right? It's that you have your true breeding P generation that gives way to a dihybrids in the, uh, or the hybrids in the F1 generation that give way to the F2 generation, uh, which follow these rules, right? Awesome. So we're going to cross these guys. Just like that. And what Mendel figured out is that when we're tracking two traits, it produces a 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio every time. Every time. Where 9 of the offspring are going to be dominant for, or exhibiting the dominant trait for both. So here we go, nine are going to be yellow and round. Three of them are going to be dominant for one trait. In this case, this guy's round. Three of them are gonna be dominant in the other trait. This guy, three of them are yellow. And only one is going to be recessive for both. Every single time. I know my cadence is getting strange, but I can't tell you. This stuff blows my mind. Every single time, without fail, whether we have 500 plants or 5 million plants, we will always see nine of them being dominant for both traits, one of them being dominant for one, one being dominant for the other, and only, or I'm sorry, nine, three of them, this one guy right here, being dominant for one trait, three of them being dominant for the other trait, and only one little guy over here recessive for both. It's wild, nine to three to three to one. Say that in your sleep. So how do we solve these problems? Number one, because you'll have to do, we're gonna do this, ad nauseum. Write down the symbols for the alleles. Sometimes they're given for you. Step number two, write down the genotypes given. Uh, if the phenotypes are given, then write down the possible genotypes. Determine what the problem is asking and write out the cross as genotype times genotype. We're gonna set up the Punnett square and go from there. We will do this practice. This will be part of your notes. So let's practice. A tall plant, capital T, capital T, is crossed with a short plant. Lowercase t, lowercase t. What percentage of the offspring will be tall? This is how we solve this. We're going to write out the symbols for the alleles. 
capital letter is tall, lowercase t is short. Capital letter dominant, lowercase letter recessive. You're going to write out the genotypes that they give you. Sometimes they won't give it to you. Sometimes they'll just say a tall plant is dominant and crossed with a short plant, which is recessive. You're going to have to figure it out. Then you're going to write out the cross and set up the Punnett square. That's how it'll look. Then you cross them. So how we got that, let me do that with you. How we do that is the same thing as like a multiplication table is that you come down here and this is capital T, capital T, because this guy goes down this way. Same thing with this guy, he goes down this way. So that's a capital T, capital T. And then this guy goes across this way. It's like a genetic Sudoku. Only one can go in each. Once you get fancy with it, you could just do it by sight and go, oh, one, two, one, two. Boom, that guy goes that way. So there you go. Then you have dominant for each. Answer, 100% of the offspring will be tall. Because remember, do all this work all you want, but what are they really asking? They're asking for the percentage of tall. All right, let's try again. A round seed shape is dominant to a wrinkled shape. A plant is heterozygous for the round seed shape. Uh, wait, a plant that is heterozygote for the round seed shape is crossed with a plant that is homozygote for round seed shape. What percent of the offspring will be homozygote dominant? First thing we're going to do is write it down. Capital R is dominant. Brown seed is dominant. So capital R, dominant. So lowercase r would be the opposite. It would be wrinkled. Next thing we're going to do, let's set up our Punnett square. We're going to have a round seed shape. It's dominant to wrinkled. We're going to do a heterozygote for round seed shape. Hetero meaning different. So we're going to have one capital R and one lowercase r. That's the first plant type. We're going to cross that plant, homozygote, homo meaning same, for round seed shape. We know that round is dominant, so we put our capital R and our capital R. What percentage are going to be homozygote dominant? So we have this here. And what are we really looking for? Homozygote dominant. So we're looking for a capital R and a capital R. Homo meaning same, dominant being the capital. So here we go, we cross it, and this is what we get. So what percent of their offspring is gonna be homozygote dominant? We see one and two. 50% of them are gonna be homozygote dominant. If they asked how many of them or what percent of them are going to be a brown seed shape, you would say 100% because those dominant alleles in here mask the recessives. So be careful what they're asking. It can be tricky. In cats, I know, if you're a cat lover, this unit and the next one's all about you guys because you get to meet my cat Mayhem. She's a calico. In cats, short hair is dominant to long hair. A true breeding short-haired cat is crossed with a cat that's heterozygote for the trait. What percentage of the offspring will have long hair? So short hair is dominant. So let's do capital S. They'll probably do it for us. Oh, they're going to do H for hair? Fine. All right. So capital H is short hair lowercase h is long hair. Now we have a true breeding short haired cat. So true breeding short haired would be, I'm gonna do it on my own, I don't care what they say, is going to be, is it true breeding short haired? It's gonna be capital H, capital H. 
And then a cat that is heterozygote for the trait. So that's going to be capital H, lowercase h. Hetero meaning different or opposite. There we go. We're going to have a capital H, capital H, H, H. And then for our second allele over here, I'll do another capital H, another capital H. But down here, we're going to do a lowercase h for recessive. Great. So we crossed it. What percent will have long hair? Long hair is the recessive trait. Fun thing about recessive traits, you need two of them. How, what percentage will have long hair? Zero. None will have long hair. You need two of the alleles to express a recessive trait. So that cute little kitty short hair and that cute little kitty short hair. Remember what they're asking. Go through the process. It seems long, but do it. It's helpful. Let's do another. A purple is dominant to white flowers. In a homozygote dominant purple plant, what gametes would be produced? What about a plant that's heterozygote? They give you the answer. All right. D, dominant to white, homozygote dominant purple plant would be capital P, capital P. What gametes would be produced? What about a plant that is heterozygote? It would be capital P, lowercase p. Homozygote dominant plant gametes would be all uppercase P. The heterozygous plants for the gametes would be uppercase or lowercase. There you go, just like that. But look, they're both purple. Wild. Genes are crazy. In pea plants, purple flower color is dominant to white flower color, and brown pods are dominant to wrinkle pods. If a true breeding, purple flowered, so true breeding, purple flower, purple's dominant. Capital, capital, round pod, round is dominant, so that would be in capital R, capital R. We're going to cross them with true breeding, white flower, so that's, uh, where is it? This is white recessive. There you go. So it's going to be lowercase p lowercase p. Again, see how the p is? It's done. Uh, wrinkled. So lowercase r, lowercase r. You use the same letter. Generally the dominant letter. Uh, what will the resulting F1 generation? Don't do a Punnett square. Don't do it. Why? Because it's true breeding for both. We know what the true breeding for both is. All of your offspring are going to be the same. These are true breeding parental generations. Remember what they're asking. It's the resulting F1 generation. Remember, F1 generation looks all the same. They're all dominant for everything. It's the F2 generation, the grandkids that get all varied up with those crazy ratios. In pea plants, purple flower color is dominant to white flower color and round pods are dominant to wrinkle pods. If a plant that is heterozygote for both is self-crossed, what would the phenotypic ratio of the F1 generation be? <gasps> there you go, write them down. Purple, white, round, wrinkled. Here's what we're gonna cross. The ratio for this, you find out the gametes by foiling it. Do you remember foil? First, outer, inner, last. First, outer, inner, last. Look at that. 
those are your gametes. Now, because of the law of independent assortment and segregation, now we're going to set up our Punnett square. Right? So we have, and we're going to do it the exact same way. This P is going to go down here. P, R, P, R, right? This P is going to go across. Same thing. We do it the same way. Probably does it a lot nicer than me. There you go. So you can see this P going all the way down. That P goes there, goes across, okay, and then goes down. These down here, just note, you can see that lowercase goes across here and here and there, comes down this way. So if I was you, I would start with one, the P, the dominant, this first one down here and then go with the alternating allele on the side, just so you have the right letters together. And what we find is out of 16, dominant for both traits are nine. There's nine of them, you can count. One, two, three, four, five, Seven, eight, nine. Oh, oh, these always do it for me, and I always forget that. I get excited. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Purple and wrinkled. One, two, three. Nine to three. Here we go. We're going to do white and round, so dominant for one trait, but not the other. One, two, three, and then recessive for both. Just this guy over here. Every time, every time we do this, every time you see, I have to press so many buttons to get back to the last. Anytime you see F1 generation heterozygote self-crossed. A heterozygote cross in this generation is always going to be nine to three to three, to one, always. Great, laws of probability. So the laws of segregation and independent assortment reflect rules of probability. You thought you were getting away from math. Here we go, the multiplication rule is the probability that two or more independent events will occur together in some specific combination. So for example, if you flip a coin twice, what is the probability that it will land heads up both times? Well, we got a 50-50 shot the first time, and we got a 50-50 shot the second time. That means we're going to have a 25% shot that it's going to do both times. So what's the probability of having three girls in a row? Well, we got, you know, it's a 50-50 shot. It's one eighth. So, Multiplication rule, there you go, multiply that. So if I asked, uh, what's the probability uh, of a um, an offspring having a, the recessive trait or one thing or the other thing, right? What's the probability that <clears throat> the plants are going to be both white and wrinkled? Um, okay. Practice problems. Tallness is a dominant to dwarfism in pea plants. Pea plants that are heterozygote for height are crossed, what is the probability that the offspring are going to be homozygote dominant? So first thing we do, we write down our alleles and our phenotypes, then we cross it. There's a half chance of inheriting a dominant and a half chance of inheriting the dominant from each parent, right? We got a 50-50 shot. So one fourth, that's the probability. So look at this, this is insane. So we're gonna do crosses like this. Anytime that you have more than three traits, do not do a cross for it. Use these probability laws. So the rule of multiplication allows you to not do massive Punnett squares, thank God. Instead, we're gonna do it for each initial cross. So 
uh, in a cross between these two crazy organisms, what is the probability that this is going to be their offspring? Dominant for A, dominant for B, uh, heterozygote for, uh, for both of those traits, and then a homozygote recessive C. Well, let's do the A's first. Half a chance that it's going to be this. Let's do the B's. Half a chance it's going to be, uh, you know, this. And then do the C's. And it's a quarter chance right here. So now we're looking and we're circling these. So BB up here. So we look up here. We find those on our Punnett square. That's half of them. Then we look up here and we look at this. And that's half of them. So the probability of the offspring being this is the probability of each individual one multiplied together. One sixteenth that the probability of these two offspring are going to produce this. This only works when it's like binary like this, right? So when there's like purple and white or round and wrinkled, we're going to get in the next topic into non-Mendelian genetics. That's a whole other ballgame. For this, very cut and dry, very straightforward. Big letter, little letter, little letter. So we also have the addition rule, right? That the probability that two or more mutually exclusive events will occur. So for example, what is the chance of rolling a dice that lands either a one or a six, right? Then we add those two probabilities together to create one, you know, a one third, right? One side of the die, there's six sides there, and then one side that has a six, and then there's six sides total. There you go, add them together. So let's practice. In a cross between this organism here and this organism here, what's the probability that it's going to be this or this? So we do the Punnett squares for each one, and we find out that uh, A here, so we do it for each one. What's the probability of this, this, this? And we multiply that across, right? Because we have to get the probability it's going to be one or the other. So we have to get each probability individually. Option two, again, not there, not there. Right, we're just matching them up. Boom, boom, boom. Jump, jump, jump. So half, half, and a quarter. There you go, one sixteenth. Now we add them together. If it's going to be this or this, it doubles our probability, right? If I say roll a dice, what's the probability it's going to land on a five? That's one of six probabilities, right? Like I only have one of six, but what if I say a five or a two? It adds it, right? Oh, ignore my little battery. We're almost done, I promise. So you add them together. So the probability of it being this or this is one eighth. It's a higher probability than on its own. So when we're looking at traits passed down and that sort of thing, we're going to talk pedigrees. Um, many human traits follow Mendelian genetic patterns, things like attached or unattached earlobes, or if you can roll your tongue or not. We'll talk about a bunch of different ones. And a pedigree is a family tree that gives you a visual of these traits. Uh, this is how we read them. So on the side is the generation. So that's generation one, two, and three. Horizontal lines connect parents. Vertical lines connect children. So these guys got together and loved each other and had all of, well, had this kid and this kid and this kid and this kid. All right. Then these two individuals got together and had all these kids. See, see how that works? You can see males are generally represented by squares, female circles, whether you have the trait or not. So affected male or, you know, the affected female, that's always colored in solid. There we go. If a trait is dominant, one parent must have that trait. Dominant traits do not skip generations ever. They're always dominant. This is where kitties come in. If a trait is X-linked, then males are more commonly affected than females. You may say, why? Well, 
females, and two X chromosomes, males, sometimes have one. So trait is excellent. It's more common in males than in females simply because they only need one to express it. And that's it. Yay! The reason I say we're going to talk about cats is because one, oop, uh, an X-linked recessive trait is being a calico. All right. Thank you for joining. I'll see you in class.